Coming up ahead in this episode of X Talk Spotlight. The changes that we saw in Alpha were really a result of organizational changes. So their baseline had changed. And to me, this is exactly what I would want to see. By combining in-clinic recordings with at-home recordings using the same setup and the same set of tools, which patients could become familiar with and comfortable with and then use in different contexts. Hello, and welcome to X Talk Spotlight, illuminating insights from subject matter experts and industry thought leaders. I'm Sonia Hunt. In this episode, we are asking a question regarding Alzheimer's dementia. Should EEG be used as a functional biomarker of target engagement and organizational change when evaluating treatment efficacy? Immune Bio Inc., a clinical stage immunology company, recently reported significant findings from a pilot study targeting Alzheimer's disease. In collaboration with Cumulus Neuroscience, the study used the Cumulus Neuroassessment Platform, which includes an FDA 510 cleared and UKCA marked dry sensor EEG headset. This headset is synchronized with digital cognitive tasks that can be used in clinic or at home to enable decentralized and hybrid trial designs and the collection of longitudinal real-world data. In this X Talk Spotlight edition, I sat down with Dr. C.J. Barnum, Vice President of CNS Development at Inmune Bio, and Dr. Brian Murphy, Co-Founder and Chief Scientific Officer of Cumulus Neuroscience. Together, we discussed how and why EEG-derived biomarkers should be used in studies evaluating potential treatments for Alzheimer's disease. CJ and Brian, thank you so much for taking the time for this Spotlight interview. Thanks, Aisha. Really happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. So to start us off, Immune Bio issued a press release recently announcing that patients with Alzheimer's disease who received treatment for four weeks with your novel drug candidate had a statistically significant increase in alpha wave frequency and power as measured by the Cumulus Neuroassessment Platform. Before we dive into the study data, could you provide an overview of EEG and specifically alpha power and share why this is meaningful as a biomarker? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so EEG is actually the longest established technology and the most direct technology we have that's non-invasive and measures brain activity. And then within EEG, oscillations of the alpha band that are in fact the strongest rhythm you see in the healthy brain. Uh, it's typically between about 8 and 12 hertz. And uh, this is interesting in this context because it is something that we see in healthier brains. So in people as they are doing cognitive tasks. We see uh, changes in alpha power. It's an indication that the different parts of the brain are in communication with each other, or are coordinated with each other, uh, that your brain is able to uh, decide what to spend its attention and its resources on uh, to effectively perform cognition. And then if we also look in uh, for analogs, you'll see in the literature that people who are very effective in their thinking skills have effective alpha. And we also see that as people age, and neutrally, that the alpha power and alpha frequency decline slowly. Uh, so for all of these reasons, any increase or improvement in alpha power frequency is indicative of improved connectivity, improved brain function, and we guess also improved cognition. Yeah, I think this is a, a great example of uh, the collaboration that we have with Cumulus and what we as small biotech need in terms of really understanding the biomarkers out there. As Brian mentioned, EEG is well established. There have been some hurdles in the past that make it difficult to utilize in clinical trials that Cumulus has done a really excellent job in overcoming to allow us to actually look at what I call, you know, really a functional biomarker. So it's one thing to look at how proteins are changing in the brain and even how the structure is changing. It's one thing, it's another thing altogether to look and see how the brain's actually behaving and changing. And this is really a unique platform to, to do that. So, you know, when we think about how do we look at the impact of, of our therapy on the, on the brain, you know, we're looking for a functional biomarker. EEG provides that. And as it relates to getting down into what EEG means and, and how this, uh, this is affected in Alzheimer's disease, I mean, Brian and his team, they just have a wealth of knowledge. And this is just a great example of what happens when two small companies really, you know, get together and start talking about how do we evaluate things moving forward. 
So CJ, the results of your pilot study are quite compelling. Can you tell us about the study design as well as the aims of the study? This is a pretty interesting study. I mean, really what we were focused on initially is just feasibility. I mean, we're, we're talking about evaluating uh, Alzheimer's patients that are pretty advanced and trying to do it at home, which typically means a caregiver that may be a spouse that's also older in age and, uh, and whether or not we can actually get this to work. Will they use it? Do they like to use it? And can we collect quality data? We did a really small study prior to this that was quite compelling, but it was only three patients. And the idea was, let's build on that and see if we could do that. So quite honestly, my expectations were fairly low. It was really, let's sort of verify that we could do this. So to be able to see changes um, in a key metric of AD uh, within four weeks is really quite amazing. And again, what we did is, we sent patients home with advanced, uh, advanced, uh, um, uh, moderate and advanced Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we had some assessments that were taking place in the clinic, and then we sent it home with them as well. And we looked at over four weeks. Uh, so I think, you know, from my perspective, this is way more than I, I would have been able to expect uh, uh, for for the amount of time that we looked into. And and I'm happy to say that our primary goal of just, you know, will they use it? Do they like it? Can we collect data? is you know is spot on which means moving forward when we talk about looking at biomarkers of brain activity is the brain improving how is how is it behaving after a drug uh, this is a really good tool for us so i think this was a very interesting study design from our point of view as well because it allowed us together with cj and the other folks at immune to look at both the immediate effects the acute effects of a drug and then and that's before and after, so comparing directly before and directly after in the injection in clinic. And we're, uh, then we also were able to look at how there were effects that accumulated over time and re re resulted in organizational change. And of course, this is what we're really interested in, really interested in, does the drug have a persisting and consistent effect that will actually change uh, the way the brain works and result in a therapeutic benefit and improvement in symptoms for the patient? And we could have both of those two modalities of testing acute and long term by combining in clinic recordings with at home recordings using the same setup and the same set of tools, which patients could become familiar with and comfortable with and then use in different contexts. And can you tell us a bit more about the key findings in your study? Yeah, so I, I think Brian touched on that a little bit. And one of the things we really like about EEG is, you know, I, we really lump therapies into two categories symptomatic. Uh, so you can think of something like ibuprofen, right? You have some pain, you take ibuprofen, it goes away, but it doesn't cure the problem. It doesn't change whatever's causing it. It just temporarily leaves it. And the other part is uh, uh, disease modification. So curing it, if you will, for lack of a better term. Um, you know, it's there's debate within uh, the scientific community of how to actually do that. There's these really difficult clinical trial designs that I don't think really inform on that. Um, and I think EEG has a way to do that because, as Brian was mentioning, you can measure changes that occur shortly after, but you can also measure changes that occur, uh, uh, baseline changes at, over time. And to me, that gets to the the, the question of, of, of um, symptomatic treatment versus organizational changes. So as it relates to, you know, what is really compelling and interesting in this study is the changes that we saw in alpha were really a result of organizational changes. So their baseline had changed. And to me, this is exactly what I would want to see as a, you know, someone you know doing clinical development in the therapy and how to move it forward. For example, if, if we had just seen changes shortly after the drug, but didn't see any changes over time, uh, that's a, you know, that maybe informs on a different clinical development pathway. So really, really important key things. And we talked earlier there about the fact that as people age, uh, their alpha power reduces in frequency and, and uh, power in latitude. And but then if you look at disease, then I'm saying disease, it will then drop precipitously or it can drop precipitously. And uh, the reason that is is because alpha is indicating that uh, brain networks are well connected, that different parts of the brain are effectively communicating with each other. And what you would hope if you had a, a disease look fine treatment is that those negative changes in connectivity and synaptic function would be halted or even reversed, even rescued uh, more optimistically. And I think, uh, you know, we've, you, you've told me this, CJ, that you've got other converging evidence from other biomarkers about, about synaptic function, about uh, remyelination. 
I mean, this, these changes in alpha power are perfectly consistent with that. I mean, we can also see another analog is in a traumatic brain injury concussion. If people receive a, a head injury, often their alpha power and frequency is reduced. And then you could see that improving again as that person recovers to normal cognitive function. So for all of these reasons, we're optimistic that yeah. if we look at this with more sensitive tools over a long period of time, these changes, these direct objective mechanistic changes in brain function will be reflected in increased cognitive function and in general day-to-day -day function for patients. What's really interesting to me about this is this is, you know, this was demonstrated in moderate to severe patients, patients that we know are, are going to continue to decline clinically. We, we don't have any illusions that this changes that. But, you know, there's this long adage about, uh, you know, not being able to repair the brain in old patients, older patients, and especially in, in advanced disease patients. And I think what this demonstrates is that we can make changes. Uh, I think there is a, there is an inflection point at which you've lost too much biology that whatever improvement you make isn't sufficient. Um, and that really helps us sort of understand where to place the drug in, in clinical development. Um, but this is, you know, really key powerful stuff for us moving forward. Now, to date, traditional cognitive assessments, including the clinical dementia rating scale sum of boxes, MMSC and ADAS COG, along with amyloid biomarkers, have been used as primary and secondary endpoints in clinical studies. So to bring us back to our main question, why should companies developing treatments for Alzheimer's also include EEG biomarkers in these studies? Yeah, I think this is going to change. And I think it's because of, of, uh, of, of companies like, like Brian with, uh, with EEG that it, that's going to make that change. I, I mean, the simple answer is, is it's a measure of brain behavior. There's no, we don't really, we don't have any other biomarkers that do that that can be deployed. Now, one of the questions that we probably get is, if that's so, why isn't it used more often? And really, it's a technical issue. It's a scalability issue, right? Previously, you had to have really specific technical knowledge. Um, they had to come in and, and do it in the lab. And there was a, it was a whole thing. It was a lot of work. The, the burden to the patient and to the sites were quite high, and just every site couldn't do it. Um, now that there's a device that can be sent home, the, the, the patient can actually learn how to use it, do it on their own. They like to do it. They, we can collect quality data is, in my opinion, um, a, a game changer. It really is. The other point about this that I think is, is really important is as it relates to noise and measuring. I mean, one of the problems we have in clinical trials is, you know, you may have a, a baseline measure and, and an end, and a, you know, a final measurement. It's not always true. We usually have a few in between, but at the end of the day, what we're looking for is change over time. There's a lot of no inherent noise in those measures, and especially in Alzheimer's disease. And the best example of this is if you've ever met somebody with Alzheimer's disease, they'll tell you that their loved one has great days and bad days. And so if let's say the patient comes in at baseline and they have a really terrible day, right? Um, and they get randomized placebo. And at the end of the study, they have a really great day. It may look like that the patient didn't change or placebo worked when in fact, what you're really measuring there is noise. So the fact that you can use this over and over again, you can, you can, uh, more measurements we have, the more we can eliminate the noise. And this device allows, uh, allows us to capture more measurements. Patients seem to like it, so they'll do it weekly. And one of the things we haven't talked about is they have the ability to assess multiple different aspects of behavior, cognition included, alongside the EEG at home. Again, all these things are really, really important. So I think, uh, you know, as this data becomes more widely recognized um, and companies uh, see this, you're going to see a real big uptick in this. It's just too good of a biomarker. Um, and uh, to not move forward. Thinking of the clinic-based assessments, I mean, we've actually found now, it, since we designed it for home use, that it's so easy to use, it's so deployable, it's so scalable, that it's actually solved one of the problems that CJ mentioned a second ago, which is that across different sites, if you are doing in-clinic measurements, you need to have very consistent training and uh, sophisticated equipment at every site, whereas we can just send it straight out to a site with minimal training, and that solves that particular problem. 
And the other issue with clinic-based assessments in general is, especially when it's a paper and pen test or something that involves a clinician, is there might be some sort of bias. It could also be affected by the patient's anxiety level or their, are they a native speaker or not? Uh, different things like that that can systematically change the, mm. the responses they'll give. And uh, the fact that then these are objective, and as Chris says, CJ says, they're repeated day to day in a more uh, real world environment for those patients where they're relaxed, where you can see they're in their neutral environment. Uh, that is kind of a different kind of, a different quantity, but also a different quality of data that we can collect. And uh, we're really excited by what we've found just with this single, relatively straightforward passive task. People just sit for a couple of minutes with their eyes open and their eyes closed to record the CEG, so very easy to do. And then on top of that, we have all these other cognitive tasks. So we can see brains, function, uh, behavior with EEG while they're doing a memory task, while they're doing an emotional t- uh, processing task and others. So I think there's an awful lot more we can learn uh, with a bigger study with more patients. And I'm really excited to see uh, what we find out together. Well, thank you very much, CJ and Brian, for speaking with us today. We really appreciate your time and insights. Thanks, Aisha. It's always great to talk to you. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. We look forward to learning more about Cumulus Neuroscience's work in clinical research for neurodegenerative diseases. Thank you all for joining us for the Sex Talk Spotlight feature. We hope you enjoyed the discussion.